Mania, um, looking at free and open source licenses and context of existing copyright regimes. Please give them a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much for everyone for coming along. Uh, hopefully this talk will be informative and useful and uh, you'll get something out of it. It's in the broader context of my research into basically user-generated versus formal intellectual property laws. Um, so at first I thought I might start with a disclaimer, which is I am technically a lawyer, but not a practicing lawyer. Um, I'm also not your lawyer. Uh, nothing I should say, to, nothing I, I'm saying today should be construed as legal advice or uh, anything of legal import. So um, basically, if you need legal advice on something, it's really important that you should speak to a real lawyer if there's something that you desperately need legal advice. But hopefully the point of this talk is to act as a primer on legal issues for open source licensing. And this is something that where people can actually, and developers can actually use this uh, information to work out how to license their own projects uh, without the need for, for a lawyer, except in absolute necessity. Uh, something that Bradley, I went to Bradley Kahn's talk yesterday about GPL license enforcement and he mentioned that often licensing choice is a choice for, a u for the user. So for, in particular with respect to copyleft licensing there's an argument that because it excludes proprietary software that it's a choice for the user to uh, choose how to license their work. I guess what this talk is about is the matters to consider when licensing your own project, so at the very start of the licensing process, how do you make sure that you've chosen the right license for what you intend to do? And the essence of this talk is designed to cut through some of the confusion which is developed around uh, open source licensing. Obviously, this is a topic which is of great importance to many programmers uh, and free culture enthusiasts, but uh, there still seems to be a fair bit of confusion about actually how open source licenses operate and how, in particular, how they relate to the public domain how they relate, and how they relate to copyright. So, because this is a legal talk on open source licensing, uh, I think it's appropriate to include the obligatory Lessig quote. Uh, Lawyers give and take work, they would contribute the ideas they found in the space. So the idea is that in fields such as open source licensing, user-generated law, where developers and users are actually driving the formation of new legal rules, lawyers would hopefully take a secondary role in that process and ultimately uh, developers should drive the process of how open source licenses are used. So essentially this talk is just to give some background about what you want to do with the open source license. So the next slide, why license? Uh, Recently, there's been a report by the Productivity Commission of, in Australia into our intellectual property arrangements. That report was broadly supportive of the idea of open source development and the contributions that it brings to the Australian economy in terms of promoting free software development and providing a base of tools that can be used for further innovation. Uh, that was also talked about in, in relation to existing intellectual property laws, including copyright law and patent law. Now, something that is somewhat troubling about the report is that it seems to equate, so, uh, equate open source development with some form of public domain development. And from a legal perspective, these two concepts are quite different. Uh, for those of you who attended Richard's talk uh, on Wednesday, I apologise for the repetition, but copyright is a right that's given rise to by the Berne Convention, which requires that member states implement copyright laws. Now, that convention also states that copyright arises without registration. So any time you're sitting around, you're developing software, and then you publish it, there's a copyright which automatically arises and attaches to the, to the software that you developed. Now, if you release software without a license, that's great if you want that software to be as widely used as possible. Uh, there's examples, uh, CERN, uh, the HTTP daemon, uh, BLAST, which was developed, which is a pattern matching algorithm in genomic analysis, are both examples of public domain works which have been licensed very broadly. However, 
there is an issue insofar that when you do release a work without a license, there is copyright that attaches to it, but it's a, what we call it law, a bare license. And what a bare license allows you to do is basically say, well, you, you can revoke the license, but that's about it. You have no further control over how the software is used. And that, could be, and that can be problematic from the perspective of other developers because it may discourage people from using your code. Uh, at the turn of the century and throughout, um, at the turn of the millennium, there was a lot of discussion about uh, fear, uncertainty and doubt about open source licensing. Uh, there were many complaints that using open source would make it impossible to uh, rely on proprietary software. But equally, without a license, it is possible that that may make it difficult for other developers to work out how to use your software. So, why should you license your code? You should license your code if you want to control who uses it. You want to control how they use it and you want to control what software they use it with. So that, in essence, is the purpose of open source licensing from a, I guess, a contractual legal perspective, to, to, to define some contours on copyright, which can be used on, on the copyright license, which is attached to the work, to ensure that it can be used in a particular fashion. So in the next slide, I'm going to talk about how open source licenses work at law. So, start with, it's a combination of copy, contract and copyright law. Now, one of the early concerns about open source licensing, looking back at literature, was, well, how can you have a contract when there's no uh, money changing hands? How can you have a contract when software is being delivered for free? Strictly speaking, uh, contracts usually involve some form of monetary payment in exchange for goods. but that doesn't necessarily involve some form of consideration, but that doesn't necessarily need to be a monetary payment. So when you do release open source software and someone downloads it, it could be argued that by downloading your software, they receive a number of benefits, including the right, you receive a number of benefits from them downloading your software, including the fact that they're using your work, uh, recognition rights, and also the right to continue to develop your work. So there are a number of intangible benefits which attach to the downloading of that software when, or the use of your software. So accordingly, there is some form of contractual relationship which uh, is built. Uh, yes? How do you deal with privity of contract? Okay. Uh, priv I was How do you deal with privity of contract? I was going to answer that in the next um, point, which is contract law is used to give effect to license formation. So the operation of a open source license occurs through something called shrink wrap licensing, what we call shrink wrap or click, click wrap licensing at law. So what that effectively means is normally, as you say, privative contract, uh, yes, so what would normally happen with a normal contractual relationship is you have an offer and acceptance process. I would offer to sell you, you know, some good. Um, you would accept that. There would be an exchange of monetary payment. The idea of click wrap and shrink wrap licensing is the acceptance of the license is attached to a particular action by one of the parties which indicates their assent to the terms of the contract. So this is one of the terms of the GPL. By modifying and distributing the program, you indicate acceptance of this license. So that means basically by the user opening the program, compiling it, uh, modifying the software, they indicate their acceptance of the terms of the license. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I note that Bradley's talk yesterday, he mentioned a issue which has occurred amongst commercial counsel where they say, okay, if you are going to use an open source license, you need to bury it in uh, deeply within the source code so that no one can see it. That is a bad idea. Ideally, if you want people to accept the license, if you want to give effect to the open source license, you should have it as clearly marked as possible in a file, license.txt, to indicate that this is the license under which the software is released and these are the conditions on how you can use it. So 
yeah, notify notify potential users of the license. So put it up front. Um, you can obviously do that within GitHub. There's an opportunity to uh, put a basically a big notification. This is the license. This is the license. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Now the second stage of the open source license of open source licensing is copyright law. Copyright law gives effects to the conditions that control use of the software. So the idea being that uh, there are a number of, again, copyright is something that attaches to literary works, to artistic works as defined by the Berne Convention. And it, it, attract, it attacks, attracts, sorry, I, I just, uh, it attaches to the, the, art, the originality which is associated with a particular work. Now, the idea is that that originality, in exchange for that, the artist, the developer, receives certain rights, exclusive rights, with respect to the use and ongoing adaptation of this particular work. And that's a particularly important definition in the context of uh, restrictive or copyleft licensing, which I'll talk about later. So, the idea is that copyright law there are contractual copyright terms which are used to give effect to the conditions that control use of the software. And specifically, that's in, for example, in, in sections two and three of the GPL version two, there are copyleft conditions which say, uh, which specify that uh, software, the software that you develop, you need to make sure that all contributions are re-licensed under the same license and that failure to comply with this amounts to termination of the license. So, now that we've established that, it's necessary to look at what are the different types of uh, free and open source license. So we know that there's been a plethora of different open source licenses that have evolved from a, I guess, a, a contractual perspective, we divide them into two uh, broad categories. So firstly, we have restrictive or copyright license, uh, copyleft licensing, which includes a relicensing requirement for derivative works. And that concept of derivative work is something that I will discuss later in the context of uh, statutory rights which uh, attach to copyright. So these include licenses such as the GPL, um, Ephera GPL license, uh, Lesser GPL license, and cr some Creative Commons licenses. The requirement that you need to keep relicensing any improvements which are made to the original license work under the same license. On the other hand, we have permissive and academic licenses, or academic licenses, which includes an attribution requirement only. Now, historically, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, these permissive licenses were predominantly used in academic context, hence the name, uh, in academic institutions such as the MIT and uh, Berkeley. So, accordingly, they, are, they contain minimal attribution rights. And that's important within a, and that would be more important within a scientific context where, with, where there might be important, where importance attaches to the recognition of previous work rather than a requirement for work to be re-licensed. Uh, in the context of academic software development more broadly, uh, permissive licensing also gives an opportunity, also allows an opportunity for uh, re-licensing of uh, parts of the permissively licensed code under a proprietary license at a later stage in development, which uh, you'll see with the following diagram, which is taken from uh, Andrew Morin and Jennifer Urban's work, which is on a quick licensing guide for the scientific program. And in particular, they address the concept of backwards compatible and up and back, uh, backwards and forwards compatibility of upstream and downstream development. So the idea being that permissively licensed works uh, they can be included in proprietary code, in copyleft code, and in permissive code. In contrast, copyleft works, you can include permissive code in a copyleft work, uh, and you can include, and you can, but you can't include proprietary code, but you can only include copyleft code in another copyleft work. So again, that relicensing requirement requires you to keep on relicensing. Uh, you had a question? Questions? Thank you. Okay. So, again, this is the issue of upstream and downstream compatibility, which is 
something that you need to consider when you are licensing your project. Um, I believe Bradley is the expert on GPL enforcement, so I'll defer to his judgment, but I believe uh, in situations where you have relicensed, when you have licensed your work under the GPL, you need to basically keep on licensing that work under the same license or any derivatives thereof. So once you've made that choice, it's important that you are certain that you want to make that decision. Uh, something that I will address later is, uh, and you should note, uh, is that copyleft licensing does not necessarily mean that uh, the software can be monetized. It simply means that no uh, reach through licensing fees can be charged. So the next stage of this talk is to address when is an open source license breach? What are the contours of the open source of, of particular open source licenses? So, starting with permissive licenses, um, they can be breached when there's no attribution. So, if you include openly licensed code without reference to, if you include openly licensed code, for instance, in a proprietary work without reference to the original developer, then that can lead to a breach of the license. And there has actually been litigation in this regard, perhaps one of the most famous open source cases, Jacobson and Katzer, which concerned openly licensed model railway software. Uh, so the question was, so the defendant in this case basically took some of the uh, plaintiff's uh, open, openly, uh, openly licensed code under the artistic license, put it in a proprietary package, removed all the attribution notices and kept on selling it as his own, as his own work. So that raised the question, was there, actually, was there actually breach? And that raised a further question, could the plaintiff seek remedies under contract and copyright law? Now this is something important that to bear in mind, which is what remedies can be actually sought. So, if, if, the open, if an open source license is just construed as a contractual license between two parties, in the United States, you can only seek damages for the use of that software. Now, for many open source developers, I imagine this is probably an unsatisfactory state of affairs. If you have taken the trouble to openly license your code, you would, need, you would want to make sure that it is continually licensed, which raises the question of copyright remedies. So if it's a copyright, if those are copyright conditions, they are conditions on use, then they would allow you to seek other remedies such, an, as, such as an injunction. An injunction is effectively a court order which allows you to stop doing something. So which allows, which allows you to force someone else to stop doing something or to comply with something. So in the context of Jacobson and Katzer, Jacobson was seeking an injunction to force the defendant in this case to relicense the code or release the code under an open license. And looking at the terms of the open license in that question, the uh, the United States Courts of Appe Court of Appeals said, yes, these terms could be construed as conditions. They amounted to conditions as you own use rather than just covenants, which if breached would only give right to damages. So that's a permissive work. So permissive work, basically, the most likely case where someone may breach your license is if they include your code without attribution. What about restrictive licenses? Well, we know that's, that there are remedies for lack of attribution. But there are also remedies for failure to relicense the derivative work, failure to comply with the copyleft clauses. So that raises the question, what is a derivative work and how far do these remedies extend? Now, there is a recent case in this regard in the United States District Court of California, uh, Drugless and Kappa Map Group, and I incl I've included the image uh, along with an appropriate uh, copyright notice, <laughs> uh, appropriate attribution for the plaintiff in this regard. So this was licensed under a Creative Commons uh, CC BY SA license. So the question here was this particular work was included in a map compilation and without the, uh, without the attribution notice. So uh, Droglas went to court and asked the court to uh, not only license and not only include the attribution, but also require the map producers to re-license the whole thing under a Creative Commons work. Now, 
with respect to whether he was successful in that regard, the court said no, that was not a derivative work. So, so the breach of the and the court, court confirmed that the breach of the share share alike copyleft terms depended on there being a derivative work. So the a photograph was only part of a broader compilation. It did not represent the map. The map itself, the maps, and the map book did not represent a relicensing of the broader compilation, it, or it did not represent a transformation of that. So therefore, it couldn't be considered a derivative work, and therefore the copyleft uh, requirements didn't apply. All that the map producers had to do in this case was include the appropriate CC, BY, SA attribution and the attribution for the author. So that clearly shows you that courts are setting the boundaries for the how far uh, open source licences can be enforced, which is a double-edged sword because on one hand, I'm sure no one here likes litigation. Um, it's a costly process. Um, I'm sure everyone feels that the only people who win out of litigation are lawyers. But on the flip side, license enforcement does define the boundaries of an open source license. So when that happens, that reduces a, and that creates a little less uncertainty as to the extent of the open source license. And as I'm, as I'm sure many of you are aware, that uncertainty is still present, for example, in um, with respect to uh, derivative software, in particular, the recent decision with Google and Oracle has thrown a significant amount of uncertainty with respect to APIs. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the case, that concerned um, uh, Google's re-implementation of Oracle's Java APIs for uh, Android, and the question was, the question before the United States, United States Court of Appeals was, was, did that amount to a, did that amount to a, a, a breach of copyright? Was there copyright attached to the APIs? And if so, was Google's use of that uh, covered by fair use? Now, this decision has positive aspects and negative aspects. Uh, the good news is that, I guess from the perspective of free and open source software developers was that uh, the eventually one of the lower courts, the Court of Appeals, sent that back and said, and the jury concluded, yes, this was fair use, which is positive in the sense that it does place some limitations on uh, how, AP, how the holders of proprietary uh, licences can enforce their rights against open source developers. The flip side was, though, that in this case, uh, they, the, uh, the United States Court of Appeals concluded that there was copyright attached to the APIs. Now, that's problematic because, as we discussed earlier, copyright is something that attaches to literary works. It doesn't necessarily have a functional aspect, and this is the functional, uh, functional expressive divide within copyright law and patent law. Patent law is designed to protect functional works. Copyright law is designed to protect primarily literary works. Now, in this case, the APIs were, it was just a re-implementation of Java's li library. I believe Bradley has written a blog post, and I'm sure Karen's written uh, many works as well, to point out that basically this was a re-implementation of a number of different APIs which were floating around, and it was necessary for Google in order to do this, in order to uh, have Android work. So then that becomes a question, should copyright attach to something which is purely functional, which is commonly used, or where there are already many examples of that floating around uh, you know, that, that are available online, and occur accordingly where there, is, there should be no, where it, it's, it's purely, purely functional, there's no originality necessarily attached to the API. So, what does that mean for derivative software in the context of software works? Ultimately, it depends on a case-by-case -case basis, which I'm sure is a frustrating answer, but... So basically, what you need to do is you need to... is you need to look at whether it's a commonly used method or it's a re-implementation on an API or it's a complicated implementation or a unique functionality in a library. So that may depend on searching for other libraries which exist and also the degree of functionality which is present in the work. So I'll now turn to address open licensing outside the United States and uh, many of the existing open licenses have been, open source licenses have been designed to operate within uh, 
with, uh, within the boundaries of the US Copyright Act, where, which defines derivative works. Now, unfortunately, in Australian and US copyright law, there's no definition of derivative work. Instead, we rely on adaptation. So the question now is, is this a suitable substitute for derivative work? Do these things may, mean the same thing? So an adaptation is a transformation of, work, of a work into a new form of work. So uh, the classic example is a screenplay, a screenplay based off a novel. Uh, there has been some case law in Australia which says uh, a computer program which defines a particular pattern, when that is translated into a physical pattern, that is an adaptation of that work. So it's not strictly analogous to derivative works, but on the flip side, the Berne Convention does provide scope for copyright holders to have rights within adaptation, so it is possible that they are an analogous. In addition, Australia has a number of exceptions to copyright infringement, including creating interoperable programs and for creating software in the, uh, for using software in the normal use of software. Now, whether that actually extends to open source licensing is another matter. Unfortunately, these were provisions were drafted at the time when uh, proprietary so uh, with proprietary software development in mind. Obviously, there was still open source development occurring, but the actual drafters of this legislation weren't necessarily considering the iterative style of development within open source. So, whether that actually whether those exceptions necessarily cover open source development is another matter. Uh, finally, I thought I might like to turn to questions of open data licensing. So, copyright vests when there's originality in a particular work. So, recent case law in Australia and fairly old case law in the United States, uh, Feist uh, and Feist Telecommunications confirms that mere compilations of data lack originality for copyright to vest. So, but in that regard, it's, careful, it's, it's necessary to distinguish between the contents and the actual compilation of data. The contents itself may be protected by copyright. The compilation itself is, lacks probably by itself sufficient originality to for data to vest. Uh, for Europeans, uh, for people working in the European Union, uh, it's important also to remember the uh, Sui Generis database rights and the database directive, which is provided for uh, by various um, acts, which provides a additional right uh, associated with database rights. And that creates further complications for open source licensing. So there are, obviously one option is to use open license, uh, to use public domain licensing to release some of the data to the public domain. Um, Creative Commons, um, I believe, have been driving a project in order to create open database licensing. Um, another option is potentially dual licensing. So you may choose to release the software under an open license, but at the same time, the data, you may either wish to keep that a secret or use a bespoke license. So that may be important in the context of scientific research where, for instance, you have patient data. You may not wish to release the patient data under an open source license. You may wish to keep that confidential because of the privacy concerns associated with it. Or alternatively, you may have your own license coupled with the data. It's important to remember that there are two that there are different rights associated with the software and the data, despite their the close, uh, close linkage between the two. So coming to the final slides in this work, so basically, if you want to spread your source code as widely as possible and you don't care about how people use it and you're happy for it to be included potentially in other open source works, potentially in proprietary works, public domain licensing is probably your best option. If you do want attribution, so in an academic context, or you may wish to include your source code or let someone include it, uh, include it in a proprietary package, permissive licensing may be the best if you can care about controlling use and attribution. But if you want greater control over derivative works and you prefer it, prefer it if your software remained openly available, then you would be it would be probably best to rely on restrictive licensing. And it's important to note in this context that the GPL is not necessarily a non-commercial license. There are many people who do sell GPL software. It's just that you uh, can't rely on, that you can't necessarily, uh, you can't necessarily charge reach-through licensing fees. Uh, 
Uh, finally, if you have, you may wish to consider separate uh, licenses for data and software, including maybe a dual proprietary permissive license or open source software licensing and proprietary data. And that's the end of my talk. Any questions? Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> There's, um, there were two questions. First of all, license.txt, um, that's clear what it's, that it's a license, but it's totally unclear what file it applies to. And if you look at the code, there's very little link to what license.txt file it might have been associated with. So I'm, I'm very uneasy about the lack of a a link between the body of the code and a separate file called license.txt, which they all call license.txt. What's the link? Okay, so there's, again, the idea behind uh, these, I guess, clip, using that phrase, unfortunate phrase, click, click wrap or shrink wrap style licensing is that it's present when you start to use the software. So before the user can actually use the software, it's presented to them. And that's something that uh, you would need to consider when actually developing your software. As I mentioned earlier, um, as Bradley and Karen talked about yesterday, uh, there, was some, there was some discussion about corporate counsel actually suggesting that you bury the license deep within the source code. That means that it's unlikely to be seen by anyone who's using the software. The best bet is to, or the perhaps the best way of bringing it to the attention of potential users is to have it attached to uh, the download. So um, if you host your own website, you may include this software is licensed under a appropriate license to let the other to let users know this is what the license is actually attached to. Uh, perhaps as part of a compile script, have this license is this software is licensed under this work. If you have a graphical installer, um, perhaps a window to demonstrate that. So basically you need to show that you've taken steps to bring it to the attention of the uh, to uh, the attention of potential users to show that they are bound. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, I think so. Hmm. Okay, what was the other one? Um, oh yes, if I, if I release something under GPL, then people are subsequently not allowed to re-release it under MIT. But if I release it under GPL, can I then do a subsequent version, perhaps with very few changes, under the MIT license? Or am I bound by my own GPL uh, code when I actually own the copyright in the first place? Yes. Um, yes, you, you do have control over how you license the work. It's just a matter of subsequent users and developers who are bound by your exclusive rights. So you, when you are the original developer of the work, uh, your exclusive rights as a copyright holder still, still do vest with you. So yes. Um, <clears throat> can you expand a bit on the um, differences in Australia with this um, differences between derivative and, ad and adapted work because this is uh, new to me. I didn't realise that in Australia there was a difference and most of the things I've, I've read on the internet is all discusses the uh, consequences of derivative works. Mm. But if that doesn't apply here, then I've got to start rereading again. <laughs> well, that's the open question as to whether a derivative work is strictly analogous to an adaptation. Uh, now, the Berne Convention does provide that when states implement a copyright regime, they should provide uh, copyright holders with the right to, with the exclusive right to control adaptations of their work. Uh, the United States, I believe, implemented their Copyright Act, uh, their current iteration of their Copyright Act after the Berne Convention, and that includes derivative works. So, on one hand, you could argue uh, perhaps the two terms are analogous considering the existence of um, 
the, the existence of what the Berne Convention describes. On the other hand, that hasn't been tested within Australia. So it's possible that uh, adaptation and derivative work may not necessarily have the same meaning. For what it's worth, I am writing a submission to the Productivity Commission and uh, along with a number of other people at the University of Tasmania, which will include a statement to the effect of derivative, that difference between derivative works and adaptation should be cleared up. Does that answer your question? Question over here. Okay. Uh, so I was particularly interested in your comments about uh, contractual and uh, copyright license obligations and how they interact. You're probably aware that there was a historical view in free software licensing theory communities, and I admit to have mm. previously been a proponent of this idea that it should never be interpreted as a contract. Mm. Um, I've slowly uh, softened that view, uh, partly because of Jacobson and other reasons as well, uh, that I think it's probably safe for us to allow uh, the free software licenses to operate uh, both as copyright licenses and contracts at the same time. Mm. I'm curious if in your research you've found anything uh, that indicates one way or another. Is, is there any danger uh, in what you found, letting them operate as both at once, uh, and are there advantages? In my own research, no. I haven't found anything that would suggest that it's dangerous. My my main uh, research seems to conclude around, seems to uh, concern how licenses are actually drafted to. Um, so whether that whether the terms of the license are drafted as conditions or use, or whether they're defined more loosely. So I believe uh, there are problems with the um, the JSON license, as an example, where it basically cr 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 creates all of these very sort of vague terms. So the artistic license, although uh, there's been a lot of academic criticism, as I'm sure you're aware of the artistic license in the sense that it's very vague, the Free Software Foundation has issued a statement saying, we don't know if this is copyleft or not, which is pretty problematic. The court said, well, these are still defined as conditions, so I, I can't see that being the problem. My, 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 my understanding of the research is that the main problem is the vagueness of the rights associated with the licence. I think we have time for maybe one more question. So you were saying the simplest licence, if you just want to say have at it, is public domain. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been told that in the US, actually, it doesn't give you any rights because it doesn't actually spell them out mm. and that they're supposed to be spelled out like they are at MIT or BSD. Mm. Uh, so my, the recommendation I've always been given and been told to give is if you want the freest license, pick MS, MIT, BSD, but public domain mm. doesn't give you those rights because it doesn't spell them out. Mm. Um, yeah, so that was the point that I made on my final slide. So if you want, like... Um, I'll try again. Yeah, you, basically, the, the, the slide was kind of contradicting the previous one, so I was kind of wondering what is your take on this, since you were saying both things. Well, my take would be if you want the minimal rights possible, then you should probably, if you're not, if you if you want minimal rights possible, you should probably license under a permissive license. Public domain should be one of those things where you're absolutely sure you want to have no control over the work. Like, are you sure about this? Uh, otherwise, you should probably default to a permissive license. That's my answer. Let's uh, let's finish that up separately. Okay, so we are out of time. Thank you all for attending, and uh, let's give uh, James a round of applause.